Welcome back to Echo Ridge and another episode in our mini base series where I'm starting to realize how similar to an actual dumpster this colony is. First, a couple of updates. We've switched over to 100% bristle blossom. We are no longer growing any meal lice. It wasn't too bad of a transition because after all, we have plenty of water to spare. In fact, we want to keep that water moving because if we keep using this polluted water, it'll prevent this polluted water vent from becoming overpressured, which it currently is. Now, by the time this water works its way through the system, it ends up being around 57 degrees, which means we needed to chill it. Lucky for us, we had one of the Echo Classic debris chillers, and we just grabbed a little bit of the real estate and put in a liquid thermo sensor with a liquid shutoff. Now, this water sits here for long enough until we can be sure that it is less than 30 degrees. Once it is, the liquid shutoff allows it to pass, where the then chilled water will be fed to our wonderful bristle blossoms. Right now, we're only running at max 20 plants, and that is due to a combination of real estate, it's kind of all that would fit here in our pip stable, but also because if you remember, it only takes three bristle blossoms, as long as they're being turned into gristleberries, to feed one dupe. So at 20 bristle blossoms, we're going to be able to feed almost seven dupes. And while yes, we are sitting at a population of seven, we know that we're going to be going a little bit higher. But that's not going to be a big deal either because we're getting plenty of omelets and barbecue from the rest of the critters on this colony. We also made a couple of changes to our wonderful dirty brick. The temperature was starting to hover a little bit low for our comfort and we started getting a little bit too much polluted water. Not a big deal. Instead of the polluted water being filtered and then sent on to our wonderful buffer tank system, we're now just taking that polluted water, sending it through this liquid vent and dropping it right here on this very hot window tile. This achieves a couple of purposes. One, gives us more dirt, and two, allows this geothermal spike to activate a little bit more often, hopefully, eventually, draining some of this magnificent heat from this biome. But this change had a couple of unexpected effects. First, our grooming station is now considered outside of a stable, and that's because this room is now 98 tiles. So I need to put in a couple of more tiles. I had removed them because I wanted to put a bottle emptier here. We'll get to that in a minute. And literally the only space where I can see that we have available tiles is right here. And I want to make sure this liquid vent stays sitting over this window tile. Oh, I see the solution. Give me another second. There we go. We added a couple of mesh tiles over here, moved the kiln and the liquid vent and Atmos sensor. And now we are right as rain. Our slicksters can go back to being groomed again now that we're back in a stable. We currently have this thermo sensor set down at 125 degrees. And what that means is when the temperature of this thermo sensor is less than 125 degrees, it shuts this door and then starts transferring heat. I currently don't like how much heat is being transferred for one specific reason. Every once in a blue moon, we'll get a tile of sour gas. Now, it's only in the grams and it's so small that eventually the whole dirty brick will just overwrite it as soon as it lands in the right spot. Most likely where the carbon dioxide comes out of the petroleum generator. Now, if you remember my initial solution to correcting this was using a thermo sensor and setting it low enough to where the door would just barely open and close but obviously since we saw sour gas it's still transferring that heat too quickly for all those temps to pass over to thermo sensor thereby opening this door back one suggestion from the comments said why don't we use a hydro sensor and allow a little bit of the liquids to stack up in here and in that way that it sort of act like a temperature sink and I like that idea, except it doesn't really work in our use case, because the issue is only on these tiles here, which means we would have to allow the liquid level to rise here, which of course would end up flooding some of these buildings, so that's not going to work. The next solution I'm going to try is actually using metal tiles instead of the diamond window tiles. Unfortunately, if I just deconstruct the diamond window tiles, bad things will happen because all the atmosphere and liquids in here would just drop down through here, interact with this window tile, and then we'd have a huge mess. I'll be back in just another minute. As you can probably imagine, the solution is to just corner build them. Step one is going to be building a normal block here, and then we'll just replace this tile here with something like a steel metal tile. But then we're going to have to do the same thing in this tile here, but we don't want to send a red signal down to this door, so we're going to recreate the thermal sensor. With our steel metal tile in, we can then remove this tile here. We can now safely remove this thermal sensor as well, and then we'll just repeat the process. With that complete, 
everything can go back to working like normal. And hopefully, because the metal tiles aren't as good as the window tiles, it'll cause less sour gas to be created because all those thermals are going to be transferring a lot slower. Who knows, though? We'll have to see because I could have just compounded the error. And the last thing I'm going to add to this solution is a temperature shift plate. That way, the thermals get injected into this thermosensor's tile as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, our most plentiful resource that we can actually build a temperature shift plate out of, other than dirt, is actually gold amalgam. So I can't believe we're going to do it. But we're making this temperature shift plate out of gold amalgam. There we are. Now this temperature shift plate should be taking the temperature directly from this metal tile, which will help this thermal sensor read it more accurately. It may have also worked with the diamond, but using the steel reduces the thermal conductivity and will help prevent the creation of more sour gas. Unfortunately, this diamond is pretty much stuck and will be an eyesore for the remainder of this playthrough. The next issue actually caused me to learn something new about the game. Because we changed the filters around to where all the polluted water is being filtered out, which means everything else is passing through, this means occasionally petroleum or crude oil would go through. And if you remember, I was like, okay, this is not a big deal. Eventually, we'll put it on this main petroleum line, but for now, we'll just send it to the oil refinery. Because I thought the oil refinery acted kind of like a water sieve. If you send a water sieve clean water, the clean water will actually pass through it unobstructed and come out the other side. Because the water sieve sees it and says, well, I don't need to clean it. The oil refinery doesn't do that. Unbeknownst to me, if you send an oil refinery petroleum, it actually damages the oil refinery. So, insert yet another liquid filter system. If you remember, occasionally we get water in here because the oil well is sitting with its back pressure for a little bit too long, causing this water to heat up. Not a big deal, we just added one liquid filter. This liquid filter takes the water right back out and refeeds it to the oil well. But that leaves oil and occasionally petroleum passing through that filter. So we add another filter, which takes the crude oil, feeds it to the oil refinery, and the petroleum just gets added back to the petroleum line. And if you remember, we predicted this issue a little bit because we knew these slixers were going to start creating molten larva eggs. Not a big deal. And we're actually going to keep this system going like this even when we do switch over to molten slicksters. Here's the reason. If you remember, I used to have a liquid pipe sensor down here to detect whenever the petroleum was backed up to that point. After looking at it for a little while, it was sort of causing interruptions in the oil well. Every time a packet would pass through it, it would turn the oil well off and sort of flicker it. Not a big deal, but it would introduce a bug to where sometimes when the oil well flickered on, it wouldn't actually produce any oil. So I've put in a much better overflow system that we've used on some other projects. Now we just have a bridge set up. When this line is full, the petroleum will naturally bypass this bridge input and go up here. And when it does, the petroleum will start to backfill this area here, causing this liquid pipe element sensor to detect the petroleum. And then we have it turning the oil refinery off directly. This way, there's no interruption with the oil well itself, and it actually only interacts with the last machine in the giant string of events that we've talked about. But now that I'm starting to see molten larva eggs, we can go ahead and cancel larva eggs here and select the molten's. Once our first molten is hatched, we'll be able to change it over here on the critter drop-off, and then 100% of the larva eggs will then be heading directly to the egg cracker, whereas only the excess molten larva eggs will end up being omelets. But not all the updates were bad, because look who I found inside of our printing pod. That's right. This Lindsay here is going to give us a second researcher, which will come in handy when we start piloting rockets. Additionally, they're also a decorator. And it just so happens that this colony doesn't have our typical doctor decorator dupe. And while they don't have doctoring as an interest itself, they do have the caregiver buff. Additionally, they're buff, they have a green thumb, and their only negative is an irritable bowel, which I consider one of the best negatives in the game. I mean, who doesn't like a little extra time on the potty, huh? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the colony, Carol. Now, before I managed to change these liquid filters to where all the polluted water was coming out, it used to be filtered to where all the crude oil was just going up and everything else was going through here. Well, it just so happened that a little bit of petroleum got siphoned up by these liquid pumps and eventually ended up inside this electrolyzer. So now we need to break back in here because I can't stare at a broken electrolyzer this whole time. But as the usual, as soon as I open this thing up, 
we're going to be letting a whole bunch of carbon dioxide in again, which will eventually cause some damage to this hydrogen generator. But let's be honest, is that really all we have to worry about? Okay, that wasn't too bad. We'll just repair the hydrogen generator a couple times and that'll be that. In the midst of doing that repair, I completely failed to see the wonderful layer of petroleum sitting at the bottom of our electrolyzer. Considering this will not impact the functionality of this bomb, I hate to say it, I really do, but it's gonna end up staying there. Because otherwise, I'm gonna have to break this back open, destroy this electrolyzer, build ladders, go down there, mop it up, dump it, all the meanwhile... Okay, who am I kidding? Let's get in there and fix it. There we go. All nice and fixed. The last update that I have for you that happened off camera was I added a soda fountain. Now before you think I've gone all soft on the duplicates, it wasn't because I wanted to give them soda. It was because we needed some place to send all of our carbon dioxide and currently the Slicksters aren't eating enough of it, which is causing this line to back up. So all that excess carbon dioxide heads up here to a canister filler. And then those canisters are thrown in the soda fountain. Now your next question might be, where are they getting the water? Well, it just so happens that the soda fountain is conveniently located next to the bathrooms. So are the duplicants drinking cleaned pee soda? Who am I to say? The real mission of today's episode has to do with research. We've managed to finish just about the entire research tree all the way down to the beginning of rocketry. Well, and parallel automation that I always seem to miss, but we'll come back and get that. Now we have access to our space scanner and our telescope. First things first, we're going to grab the space scanner. Now the idea of the space scanner, for those of you who are only used to the DLC and have not gone to the meteor planet in the star map, is that you want to be able to detect when there is something coming towards your colony, whether this be a rocket or meteors. Now, ideally, this wouldn't be placed here, but unfortunately in the mini base playthrough, you can't build up here. So we're sort of stuck putting it down here. And once you have your space scanner in, it'll start scanning to detect whatever type of objects you'd like. In this case, we're having it detect meteor showers. Unfortunately, as you can see, the scan quality here is not good. In fact, it's zero. And it's because we don't actually have line of sight with the sky. Now, line of sight here is going to be a little bit difficult because we're so close to Neutronium here. But let me show you how we sort of solve this issue. And that's using a system sort of like this. Now, the scan quality here is only 2% and the scan network quality is only 0.4%. It's not good. The scan network quality represents how many space scanners you're running in your colony. The scan quality represents how good the scan of this space scanner is. Now, even though it's only 2%, in fact, it'll still do it at 0%, as soon as it starts detecting meteor showers, it's going to send out a green signal. When it does, we flip it with the NOT gate, and we start shutting this bunker door. Now, the disadvantage, because the scan network quality is so low, because we're only running one space scanner and its quality is only 2%, it's going to be up to the last second before the space scanner actually sees the meteors. If the scan network quality were higher, it would see meteors when they were much further out. In fact, in the tooltip, it says it will detect incoming objects two seconds to 200 seconds before they arrive. I have a feeling we're closer to the two second mark than we are to the 200. But now we have an automated system that'll open and close this door. Now this is still not without its issues. For instance, the whole system still requires power. So if for some odd reason we're having a brownout, we're gonna miss the memo on the meteors coming, which will then just keep these doors open. Also, when we're up here digging out some of these materials, if for some reason this bunker door gets closed before the duplicates are allowed in, we're sort of in trouble. In order to fix that though, we can just add a signal switch back. Because remember, a green signal overrides a red signal. So whenever we need this door open in an emergency, we can turn the switch on and the bunker door will start opening again. Hopefully not leaving any of our dupes trapped on the outside. But the reason why we're going to go through and dig all this up is because we can then sweep it, gathering up all these beautiful materials. Now when they do sweep these items, they're going to be throwing them into this automatic dispenser. This automatic dispenser has everything checked that we'll be able to find up there. The dispenser drops everything here onto the floor to which this auto sweeper will eventually grab it and throw it in the conveyor loader. We just got a little poke shell from the printing pod. I think we're going to put this little guy to use. Remember, a poke shell will eat polluted dirt and rot pile. So if we can get the poke shell to live down here, 
we can then drop all of our polluted dirt right here and it'll start eating it, making us more sand. It won't be the most effective conversion rate because we're not going to be taming that poke shell, but at least it'll give us something to do with all the polluted dirt when the composts are full. I figured out where our brownouts were coming from and I had to make a quick modification. When we did get that occasional blob of petroleum, it was going up through here and then hitting this sensor, which would then send a red signal to the oil refinery. So it was sort of interrupting petroleum flow. Easy fix, just have it bypass the element sensor and goes directly onto the petroleum line. When we put the space skater in, we had to move some things around to include this conveyor loader. But because it's now sitting on the ground here, some of the regolith coming down from the media shower would sit on it, causing it to overheat. So we're going to move it around and put it up here. There's no chance the regolith is going to sit up this high. Here's the little system I'm going to use to get the poke shell down here. We're putting a door and a tile here. We're going to drop the poke shell right here and then deconstruct this tile in which the poke shell will then take a splash down into the polluted water. There we go. Welcome to your new home, buddy. I'm just going to put an automatic dispenser here. We'll select polluted dirt and rot piles at a priority of four. That way the composts are more likely to get it and we'll drop the remaining here. Now we don't need the sand that the poke shell is going to create by eating all that polluted dirt. So in order to prevent an infinite loop, we just put a door here and are not allowing anybody to go through it. Every once in a while, we'll open these doors up, go grab the sand and whatever poke shell melts they've produced. But considering there is just one poke shell, this system is more about just destroying rot pile and polluted dirt, preventing it from off gassing than it is anything else. The next item we're going to put in is our telescope. And I think this is a good spot here. Unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do to set that up. We're going to go ahead and vacuum out this entire area and get it ready for rocketry. The first step is we had to move all the water over. That wasn't too big of a deal. The next step is going to be putting a liquid lock or two in and then vacuuming this whole thing out. One of the issues we're having is we're running extremely low on raw minerals. But don't you worry, I have a plan. Our Dracos have been hard at work starving to death and growing their scales. In fact, we now have almost six tons worth of plastic, which means we have access to plastic ladders. Sure, we're gonna go through and upgrade all the ladders that we can find over to plastic. Let's go ahead and put this on sweep only, shall we? If we see a rot pile for now, we'll go and grab it, but that way I can get in there and upgrade all these platters. In addition to plastic ladders, we also have access to plastic tiles. So in some places where it's convenient, we're upgrading all the regular tiles over to plastic as well. Now the great thing about the plastic tiles is that it has a run speed of plus 50% and a decor of 5. Your standard tile only has a run speed of 25% and a decor of 5. Unless, of course, you're using granite, and then you'll get a small decor bonus. Now we can't go too nuts with this process because like we said, we only had about six tons, but as soon as our wonderful starving glossy Dracos give us more plastic, we'll put it to good use. And now that we're finally starting our liquid lock, look at all the materials we have. We're temporarily raw mineral rich. It's a thing, don't, don't question it. If you remember a few episodes ago, we deconstructed a liquid reservoir here and lucky for us, we still have a lot of that petroleum sitting around. So it's going to be the perfect material to use for our liquid lock here. We also have a couple of gas pumps going in, so we'll be able to start the process of vacuuming out this whole area. Now that I think about it, when it is vacuumed out, we'll be able to get in here and gut this entire biome. I don't think we will 100% because I'd like to leave some heat here, but the potential's there. I've actually been impressed by the space scanner. Despite it having such a low scan quality, the past several times it has detected the meteors at least 30 to 40 seconds before they've made impact, which is plenty of time to shut these bunker doors. While we wait the additional eternity for this area to vacuum out, there's another project I've been wanting to do. And that has to do with our wonderful metal refinery. Up until this point, we've been using polluted water as our coolant. At the time, it made perfect sense. We had plenty of polluted water, and, well, it was the only liquid we had. Now we have petroleum, and it would be nice to be able to dump all that extra heat to continue to drive more heat into these steam turbines and convert it into more power. In fact, because the petroleum generators are running so much, producing so much polluted water, the temperature in here, the majority of the time, is 
under the 125 degrees for the steam turbines and it's also under the 120 degrees for the polluted water to be able to flash into the steam now eventually the temperature in here rises to about 125 126 and at that time this steam turbine takes all this steam turns it into water and sends that water throughout our colony but it would be nice if it did it a little bit more often so we're going to do the same typical system in here that we do in any of our saunas and that's sending the coolant up and around in the sauna to spread its heat around except in this case our sauna is so small we're going to send it around the entire sauna and then all we have to do to fill that loop is actually connect it to our existing petroleum line and then when we highlight over iron to steel heat production on the metal refinery you can see it's going to raise the temperature of the contained petroleum by 132 degrees that's going to be absolutely beautiful i was in the skills pane giving carol some new skills and then i realized oh we did already have a Dr. Decorator. Sorry about that, Zadnax. So instead of having Carol dabble into art and doctoring, we're going to make them our primary rocket pilot. And just like that, both steam turbines are now working. This is not only going to help with power production, but it also keeps all that polluted water instantly flashing into dirt instead of having to do it on this hot plate, which occasionally turns that dirt into a solid tile of sand. Instead, the polluted dirt just flashes where it lands. Now, ideally, I'd be filling this entire area with temperature shift plates, but while we're living high on the raw mineral hog right now, doesn't mean we'll always be. Now we turn our attention to the second goal of today's episode, and that's to start using this telescope for a couple of reasons. One, it'll reveal the star map, and two, it gets us one step closer to rocketry. We finally finished vacuuming out this whole area, but we needed to put these bunker doors in rather quick for the simple reason we don't know when the next time a meteor shower is going to hit. But now that we have these up, we can work in relative comfort. Well, if digging up 326 degree regolith inside of an Atmos suit is relative comfort to you, but when you live in a floating dumpster haphazardly navigating through the star map, beggars can't be choosers. Now Carol here is starving. They're not starving for real. They're starving in the way of, I'm so slow I can't get to the refrigerator starving. It's for that reason we also added some manual generators, and we just happened to find a nice little spot right here. This way, it'll give some of the board dupes a little something to do, and we also made it to where it'll also throw that power onto the grid. But right now, unfortunately, Carol's Athletics is only at a 4, so until they get a little bit quicker, they might be a little late to the Great Hall. And you might be wondering, how in the world can Carol not get to the Great Hall in time when the mini base is so small? Well, it has to do with the suits. Remember, Carol's not used to using suits, and they don't have suit sustainability or exosuit training yet. And considering the amount of tasks that are going in here, most every dupe is in a suit at least once per cycle. Step one was putting in our wonderful space scanner. Now, again, this space scanner is not in a great position, but unfortunately, this is about the best we can do on the mini base. We're also going to make sure to power the bunker doors. The automation line is already connected, and that way, if a meteor shower does come, we're going to be able to shut the doors in time. Now, as you can see, the scan network quality is still 0.6%. And it's because this space scanner is really in a bad position. But you'll notice this space scanner has the same network quality. Basically, if we could improve the scan quality of this space scanner, it would improve the scan network quality of the entire network. Incidentally, they don't have to physically be connected in order to share that same scan network. So you might be wondering then, well, why are we creating this one? Well, to start off with, we'd have to run an automation line all the way to the other side of the planetoid. But also because in the future, this space scanner is going to be responsible for finding out when our rocket is about to arrive home. And when it does, it'll open the doors for it. And because this is Echo Ridge Gaming and it's mini base, when it rains, it pours. Our insulated pipe full of polluted water has gotten too hot. Don't ask me how, considering it was in the middle of a vacuum. And when it did, the pipe burst, letting out a bunch of hot steam. Now, it's not a lot of steam, and we are open to the vacuum of space, so it'll eventually all go away. But it's not a big deal. Eventually, we're going to be filling this whole area with more than just steam when we start launching rockets out of it. On the good news front, these bunker doors are working, and this whole chamber's a vacuum again. And we finally have our telescope constructed. We tied it into our oxygen line, but now we have something even more exciting. Allow me to introduce you to the original star map. Now, the way this works is we are hypothetically sitting here, and within 20,000 kilometers are these two destinations. We can select one, and then we'll select Analyze Object. 
Once we finish analyzing these two destinations, we'll be able to analyze the 30,000 kilometer destinations, and so on and so forth, all the way up the star map. Now we're going to give Carol astronomy so that way, so the telescope is always being used. But truth be told, I'd rather Kudwadi do it, because Kudwadi has a science of 17. Carol only has a science of 10. Okay, this is a particularly echo type of moment. I just realized I had already named a dupe named Carol. For those of you wondering how that could happen, when I start a new series, I take all of our members and I put them in a list. I randomize that list so I know which duplicate to select first. So I could already tell you who dupe number 12 would be. And it just so happens that I forgot to check Carol's name off the list. So that's how we ended up with two Carols. Or rather, a Carol and an Ed. Sorry about that, Ed. Instantly, Kudwadi feels better about not having to call him Carol 1 and Carol 2, and has got to the business of doing the space research. And already, Kudwadi has finished analyzing our first interstellar object. In this case, it's a carbon asteroid. When you click on the carbon asteroid, another menu comes up, and there's a bunch of information in here. First, it tells you the distance. We can see that this is only 10,000 kilometers away, which we knew because it was in the 10,000 kilometer band. It also says what we're going to be able to get research from. We're going to be able to earn data banks by sending a rocket here that has a research module on it. And this is the reason why we have to use the telescope. Because until you analyze planetoids on the star map, you can't travel to them using your rocket. If you can't travel to them in your rocket, you can't use the research module on them, which means you won't be able to get any data banks. So regardless, we're going to have to start off using the steam engine just to get to the first few planetoids. Additionally, the more we do the research on it, we'll be able to learn more about this asteroid itself, which when we analyze it, will unlock additional things that can be picked up from this asteroid when you return here with a cargo module. The window also shows the world mass available and how much of that mass this asteroid replenishes per cycle. We can see that this planetoid starts off with refined carbon, coal, and diamond that we'll be able to get. There's two additional components found here, but we won't know what those are until we finish some research. And then finally, this gives you the percentage on the artifacts that can be found here, with there being a 50% chance that you're not going to find one at all. So I'm going to be spending significant portions of time off camera revealing more and more of this star map. So hopefully by the time the next episode rolls around, we'll have just about all of this revealed. And then it'll be time to put a rocket into this silo. For those of you wondering, well, what about the regolith when it lands on the telescope? If this was a full vanilla playthrough, we'd do some whiz bang and sexy things to be able to cool the telescope and to protect it from falling regolith. But in this case, it's really not worth it. We'll just occasionally deconstruct it and rebuild it. We did make it out of steel, so as long as we get here to dig it out a little bit quicker, we should be okay for multiple meteor showers. I've decided since we're so rich on raw minerals that we're actually going to complete this ladder rung now. It'll help the duplicates be able to get up here a little faster, hopefully preventing damage to our telescope in the future. We'll take note that right now it is cycle 303, and that way by the time we come back for our next video, we can see how long it took to analyze all of the interstellar objects. Because we can't put a rocket in there until we're done with the telescope. I hope you had a great time with this episode, and are still enjoying this series just as much as I am. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon.